Welcome to the Wild Ones podcast, where we talk about bike stuff. I am Francis, and this is Jimmy. How are you? I'm quite tired. It's been a busy week. It has been insanely busy because we're trying to get a lot of stuff done before going away on a top secret trip. Coming up soon. And then holiday as well. And then holiday. A non-secret secret holiday. My first actual holiday in many, many years. Well, is it? Yeah. You're always, you know, swinging around places. That doesn't mean it's a holiday. I'm, I'm, well, one of the reasons I've been busy this week, and I've been pestering you as well about bits and pieces, is Atticus is officially back. Wait. So we sorted our uh, manufacturing challenges that we've had. Uh, I think we're on the third supplier or something rather this year. Um, launched our bib shorts, and the pre-order on that is already closed, so if you want them, you can't get them. Uh, and we're very soon going to be launching a couple of pre-order jerseys, one of which... I'm so excited about this. ...we've been working on together. Mm. Mm. How much do you want to give away on it? Probably not very much. Not very much. It is uh, close to my heart. Your eyes light up when you talk about it. Yes, and the design <laughs> as well. I, I, the, the, we nailed the design. It's really very good. good. It's very good. I, th- I think a lot of people are going to like it. Yep. Before we get into cycling news this week, we wanted to acknowledge the very sad events uh, of the Tour de Suisse, where Gino Maida, young racing cyclist, uh, died after a crash in the race. His family, as a gesture, wanted the race to continue, but a huge loss for the world of pro cycling and cycling in general. So we offer our sincere condolences and sympathies. Now, on to the news. The first thing we're going to look at today is a possible controversial topic of why SRAM is beating Shimano. You think SRAM is beating Shimano? Well, apparently you think it. I don't. I actually do, yeah. I do actually think it is. Okay. In the performance market, SRAM is beating Shimano. I think the offerings are better. It's fully wireless. Everything is compatible with everything. If you ride off-road and road, all the stuff works together. Shimano doesn't do that. When you say performance, you don't mean like racing performance. You just mean like function, functionality. Enthusiast and above. Perhaps performance is the wrong word. But they are, they perform extremely well. Yeah. But the uh, the group sets that I'm talking about from, from Apex upwards are all enthusiast focused. They're all pretty expensive mm-hmm. in the grand scheme of things. They are all... Premium. That's what I think. Have you seen that SRAM have just launched a new Apex? Yeah, I, so I haven't looked at it properly. I'm hoping you have some... I want to question you about it because I know what the old SRAM Apex was like. They did a... The SRAM Apex 1 was the latest version before this and that was like a one by group set that not many people bought. What's the new one? How do you know not many people bought it? Because I've never seen it ever, ever, anywhere. <laughs> what is it? What? And Rival was nearly the same price. Was the, it was almost not worth buying. That Apex you're talking about, is that different from the Apex, the mechanical Apex of like five years ago? Yes. There was, it was still mechanical, but it was a newer version, one by owner, I, yeah. I didn't a, know. A, it's, called, it's called Apex One. Right. Whereas it was always fairly close in price point to Rival ETAP, which then you get wireless shifting... Thank you. Just it's a massive upgrade, and the price point wasn't that different. So the new Apex is wireless, right? ETAP batteries, same like thing. All the other ones. Okay. Um, it's all electronic, as you'd expect. Yeah. Um, officially, the cost is about twelve hundred pounds for a group set. Okay. I think individually the parts are quite reasonably priced. So say, for example, I actually think where this group set is phenomenal. £1,200. Is if you already have a gravel bike and you want to convert your mechanical gravel bike to an electric bike, you can buy the shifters with brakes or the shifters with calipers even for £260. Well, it's about 260 quid. A rear mech (laughs) for a similar figure and all of a sudden you've upgraded your mechanical bike to... Hydraulic braking, ETAP shifting. Is it a gravel thing? <clears throat> yes, XPLR. So it could... Right, okay. And it can be... Re- <laughs> <laughs> so, the RRP of rival ETAP, 2 by 
is £1,351. Is, is that the full group set? That's like rotors, chain, everything. That's rotors, chain, everything. Right. So it's about, so it's not that much. It's, it's about, about the same price. It is about the same price. I don't get it. It's a very similar price. It's very similar. It's a little bit more expensive. Like if you buy the stuff. So it, it, again, you're in the same situation where it's probably not worth buying the Apex. So, Ram, what are you doing? Do you still want to stand by your statement? E Emily's asking if we still think that SRAM is better Shimano, and I think the answer is still yes, because it all just works better, in my opinion. It doesn't work better. It does. It, 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 it's, it's, it all, it's all cross-compatible, it, it functions really well, and it doesn't go wrong. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But neither of them go wrong. The Shimano shifts very slightly better, in my opinion. Not in my opinion. Well. But yeah, that performance, that enthusiast market, sorry, is dominated by SRAM at the moment. It seems to be, doesn't it? Or edged by well, SRAM. Well, perhaps, perhaps in like people that are like upgrading and changing things, I still feel like a lot of bikes off to the shelf are being spec with Shimano. Mm -hmm. um, your SRAM Red. Yeah. You were riding that a lot because you took it on bikepacking trips and everything. Oh, I don't like tens of thousands of miles on that now. How have you found that group set for... Because a lot of people think that SRAM doesn't work very well. You've ridden that group set a lot. Mm -hmm. How have you found it? Yeah, I had it as SRAM Red, mullet style, the Eagle uh, XX1. So the top end, everything. Uh, road and mountain mix. And all of it has worked flawlessly. And I, I have um, had multiple accidents with it. Crashes, uh, in and out of cars, bent Mac hangers, all sorts of in stuff a, that in, would in and out of cars. It. What, like cars, trucks, what the bits of America were that's been smashing in and out of cars? No, like pretty, pretty physically put in it, <laughs> <laughs> where it's been squashed by stuff. The mech is. Uh, I thought I'd been pretty um, reckless with it. And then Nick saw it and was like, no, nah, it's actually a pretty good Nick compared to, <laughs> compared to Mark Ross's mech. Because right. <laughs> they just smash it against trees all the time. Um, it's a quality piece of kit. It really is. The only thing I don't like about that SRAM Red is the shifters. The, the, ergonomics. the ergonomics. They are old. They feel old. They feel nowhere near as well designed as the new. I don't know how they've made the reservoir and the shifter so much smaller. But the, the design work on the new Force, the new Rival, and probably... The new Apex is far superior now to the shape of the SRAM shifters. Yeah. Um, the luckily, that's all the kind of thing you can upload, uh, upgrade, upload for YouTube on the brain. That's the kind of thing you can upgrade easily just with levers and calipers, right? Yes. Assuming it all still works. With well, we new stuff. We actually did that on your gravel bike. Is your your own personal gravel bike now has a red crank, your Eagle rear mech. But we drive all shifters. But we just we it we didn't have a set of shifters to rebuild it. Yep. So we yep. bought a set of shifters, which was like two hundred and something quid. Yep. Uh I guess that's per shift. It's about three hundred and fifty, four hundred quid for a set of shifters, and then it just all worked. Yeah. Now the compatibility thing is a fair comment because Shimano doesn't have that. Because of all the different speeds, which I assume they're trying to fix with Shimano Q's. C U E S, which will be replacing a lot of their lower end group sets. But SRAM, um, uh, even though they don't have an entry level offering, they at least it's 12 speed all the way through. Correct? The new SRAM is, the new Apex is 12 speed. Uh, yes, I believe. Yeah, they are. yeah. So that's, that's good. That's cool. You can just buy any of it and it all matches and mm. fits and the replacement parts, are, are, you know, they're going to fit. I, th I think that's cool. I like it. I think horrible tech companies refer to that as. An ecosystem. Mm. Well. Francis, mm. have you ever thought whilst riding your bike that your helmet isn't servicing your needs? You want me to say no, but the answer is yes. Go on. I have never had a helmet where I can put my sunglasses in the front. Why? And it really winds me up. You haven't had the right helmets then. Or well, the, the right sunglasses. Like, I don't understand. Why can everyone do that and I can't? Every single, I've got multiple helmet companies, multiple helmet, uh, multiple brands, multiple models, different sunglasses, it never fit. There, there I, is, I, I, every time I choose a combination that doesn't work. There definitely Look, is some that don't work. I, I have found them all. If you want the list, the, I've got it. <laughs> I can write you a list. 
combinations to avoid. Well, thank you. So our rise is ruining the lead of this section. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I did ruin it. Uh, so should we? Let's just we'll we'll, take, we'll let's backtrack. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, pretend I'm saying no. Francis, no. Have you ever found that your helmet doesn't service your needs? No. Especially when you're off road on the gravel paths of the northeast. No. Oh! No. It's always been fine. Well, I've got the perfect product for you. The new laser. Zero Kinetti Core Helmet. Catchy. Specific for your gravel riding needs. Gravel specific. So Laser have released a new gravel specific product. Uh, Laser is same company as Shimano. Is it? Yeah, owned by Shimano. Yeah. What did they buy them or is it? Yeah, that's why all the Shimano riders are sponsored by Laser as well. Like it's a. I did not know thing. that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it operates as a separate company, but they own by them but Shimano are notorious for that as well they do gravel specific things they do shoes well they're specialised everyone does gravel shoes but yeah it's, um, it's got to do a gravel shoe it's like a flexi sole version of the mountain bike shoe let's not get into the service of flexi sole flexi sole shoes yeah but the uh, it, there is I don't know, there's some products that I get gravel specific makes sense for example a bike Beyond that. Mm. Yeah. So this new helmet, mm -hmm. the key features to it are bump-proof sunglass slots that keep your shade secure on rough roads. So if that's true, then that does actually solve a problem for you. However, I have never found that an issue. A small visor that keeps the sun's glare off of your face and helps protect against from insects flying into your face. That's what the sunglasses are for. So don't put them in your helmet, put them on your face. Could try that, yeah. You could try that. It's lightweight. Weight is never a consideration when you're when you're riding off road on gravel stuff because your bike's going to be heavy. You're going to be. You probably got luggage. You got frame bags. You're carrying loads of food. Blah, blah. Although no, as we discuss, I mean, no, you wanted to be all helmets. Lightweight is better. You don't want the situation like with the you know when you when you put a GoPro on your helmet, it's not that much heavier, but it's way worse for yes. your neck, isn't it? Hurts. But when have you put a helmet on and been like, this is like anything other than a helmet a typical helmet you put on you go it's a helmet it goes on my head mailbox monday what the the lumos one mm -hmm. yeah but you're not you're not you're going like oh i can notice it but you're not going like this is gonna like ruin my life no okay yeah lightweight's a roadie term anyway it's not a gravel term uh utilizes controlled crumple zone crumple zones even to absorb impacts so it does what helmets are meant to do yeah i would hope all helmets do that yeah I mean, I wouldn't wear that. I haven't. I'd prefer road helmet. I haven't looked at it, but I I see zero place why it, it, that I would ever go and buy a gravel helmet, mm. and and then like put it next to my road helmet, rather yeah. than just use the helmet I always. Yeah, you know, I don't see a massive problem with people with companies labeling stuff gravel specific, but indoor specific winds me up a bit. Go on. I get like it. We're on the turbo, no shirt. Obviously, because it's just so hot. I've I've done turbo sessions outdoors in the snow, and you still get too hot. <laughs> so take your shirt off, like just take it off. Why why do you need a, a base layer and a special jersey for that? In addition to that, shoes. That was another one. Someone did some indoor shoes. Well, what, what, what? I can't remember which brand. What just breathable shoes? I guess they're maybe targeting people who do spin classes and stuff like that. Right. So they're probably super thin, not going to be very good if, you, if you're if you using them outdoors and scuffing them on stuff. But that's really breathable. But have you ever had a problem with feet actually feeling hot on a turbo session? I've never thought about it. No, no exactly. So if you don't think about it, it's probably not happening. I, I remember I remember Lacole did some... Um, I think they did it... It was a collab with Wahoo, yeah. and they did a an indoor bib short and jersey and i'm sure whoever paid the extortionate amounts of money for it are probably convinced that it's great however it's an absurd product made out of fabric that's like base layer fabric and i think castelli have done one as well right so the idea is it's thinner so it keeps you cool uh yeah but not cooler than nothing than taking it on yes or having a fan which you probably already own but don't take your bib shorts off well, why not well i mean if you're that hot Oh, that's where the product would come in. Uh, so I mean, Jimmy were on 
Do you know what I'm going to say? No, I, don't. <laughs> I spend a lot of time on the internet looking for weird products. <laughs> and I sent you a link to it. It was a saddle with a chamois on oh, the sa- on yeah. the saddle. Mm. But maybe that is perfect if you want to do naked turbo. Or it it bo- would help. Bottomless turbo session. It would help. Or just like a more padded saddle. It's essentially what that is. What, double chamois? Well, no, no, no. You'd be naked, but you just use a more padded saddle. Oh, yeah. But no, but this looks technical and cool. I'd have that. It was so good, mate. It does not look technical and cool. That is not true. So good. I, th- I, think, my, I think my biggest problem with this helmet is gravel, in my opinion, is a marketing term. Yep. That actually represents people that want to do stuff on a bike that's somewhere in between a road bike and a mountain bike. Mm-hmm. So, in my opinion, you could have one bike which does all of that stuff, excluding mountain biking, and it would be a, by definition, a gravel bike. But that's because it's got endurance geometry. It's a much more upright position. It's got a long wheelbase. It's got not, not everybody wants really relaxed geometry though for their gravel bike yeah but even if it, it, it's more relaxed than an aggressive road bike it is it is yeah, more yeah. than suitable for riding fast on a road and riding it off-road or riding it slow on road ultimately the the gravel market is actually what used to be the endurance market and the cyclocross market blended together it's just a, it's just a marketing term like in this country gravel isn't gravel it's more closer to cycling. Yes. I can't, I, I, despite it being a, a term coined by the marketeers, I like it because all bikes now have more clearance. They're, they're more versatile. Yeah, yeah. They're more versatile. Yeah. They're, be- they're better. They fit people and they have tire clearance. Brilliant. We should rename it. What do you want to call it? But I think, I think it was always going to end up being that because the research and the aerodynamics research is, is even in the road bike space is saying, actually, people should be riding bigger tires. So manufacturers, even on the road side, are having to build bikes with bigger clearance. So it was it was always going towards that way. It's just perhaps sped up uh, going from like a, a, a road bike that can take 38 mils to actually a gravel bike that can take like, well, what, what's, what, what can gravel take? Like massive. That one's, uh, was, uh, my gravel bike uh, is 45 mil tires, but you can, Put, I've got like two inch tires in there. Right. You put a two point one, so a lot of a lot of clearance. What's that in millimeters? <laughs> as soon as you go bigger than, <laughs> as soon as you go bigger than fifty mil, it becomes a different measurement. Yeah. Why? <laughs> uh, do we have anything to add on uh, our opinion of a gravel specific helmet? Uh, wouldn't wouldn't buy it. <laughs> so yeah, not for me. Also, the article that I that popped up when I looked this up was on Yahoo. And the the thing they're pushing is with the massive growth of gravel racing in recent years, everything from bikes, tires, saddles, blah blah blah. But gravel racing, you're not going to use that. You've got a peak on the front. Gravel racing, you probably want an aero helmet. Yes. So it's just. So the problem with places like Wahoo is they're just regurgitating a press release. Yahoo. Yahoo. Wahoo. Wahoo. I said my Wahoo. School oh yeah, wrong one. <laughs> the problem with press is they just need content. So Shimano sends them, or presumably Shimano or Laser, whoever else do the PR. Just like their PR thing, yeah. yeah. Sends a generic press release. It'll have pictures in it, and they go, well, that's an easy bit of content. Mm. Slam that up, and it's like more or less verbatim what the press release is saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is, you know, what they want, what what Laser wants to be said, whether that's accurate or not. Like, if you f- like properly fact-check that, then really it's you're going to look at it and go like, what a stupid thing for us to be talking about. Mm. And now we're talking about it. God. Saying it's stupid. It worked. <laughs> We've probably sold loads of laser gravel helmets. Uh, it's the big question of the week. Big question. It is. It's probably the biggest question in the cycling industry or the bicycle manufacturing industry right now. Are rim brakes officially dead? Is that because specialised? Well, not just specialized, but you know the 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 group set manufacturers as well. Um, are the group set manufacturers doing that, or are they just removing rim brakes for like super high end group sets? Um, name a SRAM group set. Yeah, as we've discussed, enthusiast only. That is 
available for Rimbrae. Enthusiasts only. There are, you can, I think you can technically get like four. As a horse one, yeah. But like. I think I got the last ever one ever. They're hard yeah. to get, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like my force. Do you know a cam? What? Well, no, that, I guess there'll be cam pack group sets that still do, do Rimbrae. Yeah, lower. All right, I've got, a, I've got a new question for you then. Okay, new question. Can you think of, off the top of your head, any new bikes that are rim brake? Yes. Go on. Villia made one. I can't remember the name. Do they still make it? Yes. Came out last year. And their selling point was, it's a rim road bike with rim brakes. Yeah. Can you, think, the... can you think of another one? Uh... The Scott make one? They don't anymore, do they? Well, the, no, the new version of the Speedster. There is a rim. The, uh, yeah, yeah. It's the one we bought. That was the, that's the latest model. But they don't sell it anymore. They do. You sure? Yes. And it's actually it's got current this year's model. And they have stock. We got the first ever one. Yeah. Or is, it, or is yeah. it like one of those like... Well, we got one. Whether that means it's in stock for other people, I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, because I was nagging them to send me one. I think we so. can definitely agree that there is a very definite movement from manufacturers away from rim brakes. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's less and less options. Um, and it's kind of sad. I like a rim brake. Particularly on the really low end bikes like the one we bought from Walmart and the one from Halfords that we bought. So we did a series where we bought cheaper or more affordable bikes from some big retailers like Halfords, Walmart, Decathlon. Two of them at extremely low price points were disc brake. And I think we both agree, neither of them should have been because they would have been lighter, easier to maintain, easier to use, functionally better uh, yes at I, that price point because you're using cable discs which are and, and not okay you can get premium really fancy cable discs and yeah they'll work great but they're a lot of money the ones that are installed on those bikes are not they're just not very good i do agree that those bikes would be better rim yeah however i think currently it's harder to sell a rim brake bike than it is a disc brake bike I think because the industry is transitioning to disc brakes, people are becoming more reluctant to buy a rim brake bike because it feels like at some point in the future, parts are going to become scarcer. Oh, parts are going to be, right, okay. Yeah. But... That's a question for bike shop. You can shop. still get like six speed cassettes and things like that. Yeah, forever. And I reckon you will forever. I would have thought so. Yeah. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we're like... The ba the place where we are is the enthusiast performance space of road cycling, but the majority of bikes that are sold and bought and sold in the world are actually entry level bikes or bikes for commuting for everyday use. Yeah, for sure. Think of all of the uh, when w rim brakes will really be dead when you start seeing all of the Halfords hybrid bikes coming with disc brakes only. So I, I I'd like to go in. I'm going to look next time we're in the yeah. some more shops. Uh, and just see I think what's on all of those bikes. I think you'll be Load surprised disc. how many of them are going to be disc brakes yeah, now. For a few. Like entry level discs with like mechanical shifters yeah. and. So, I, if I think of friends who, who are not into cycling but they do ride a bike for commuting, they probably, if they were buying a new bike, I reckon they'd you know, be like, what, a disc? That would be better. Mm. It, it, is, it is a funny one because I, I would only. I, ma I imagine I would only buy disc brake bikes going forward, but I do really like rim brakes. Mm. Mm. I, don't, I don't even know why. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Yeah. They, they work but well. But we're not, just... we have been doing it for a long time and mm. maybe we have an attachment to it. Whereas someone who's getting into cycling now, what if they're, you know, 17, 18, they've only ever seen disc brake bikes around. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. Like, a lot of why would I get that old Yeah. Deck? Is probably what they're thinking or, or even if even like they're older but they're new just getting into cycling mm -hmm. you you wouldn't know any different really would you yeah and you're probably wondering actually probably rim brake bikes of 10 years ago which are the sort of bikes that we like probably to a new cyclist look like what 80s and 90s rim brake bikes look to us like prehistoric Old. yeah I love. I like Old them. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was actually, I still buy them. <laughs> I, I was actually. I cycled. Uh, I know. I drove past someone the other day. An old guy on a bike that was way too big for him, but it was the Pantani Edition Bianchi bike, 
and I want that bike so bad. Because you look like Pantani. That's not why. I just, I just, for some reason, I'm not like, I don't, I don't, I'm not you massively into sports. Pantani. But I think there's something about Pantani which is like romantic. He's for me, he's like the romantic cyclist. Yeah. Even though he was like heavily on drugs he, and uh, unfortunately died. He was in the news recently. He's being. They are. There's something being produced about his life. Is there? Yes. A new either film or documentary mm. series thing. I, think I might. Uh, I don't know if it might just be text only. Is it? There's it some sort of investigation and going on. They are interviewing. Uh, legitimate members of the italian mafia oh my God. about uh because there was obviously some involvement and yeah. money being you know some shady stuff going on emily have you found it BBC podcast series podcast there's a bbc podcast being produced about pantani's life oh, wow. and they're interviewing members of the mafia there you go so it sounds like Crazy. they should probably you will uh, love it pantani's about to be cancelled it sounds like well to be fair uh, he kind of already was cancelled he was known for being a was he not ready? He, well, he was just heavily, he was just like the Lance Armstrong era of doping, wasn't he? It yeah, was yeah. Pantani or, or Armstrong. But tragic as well. The story. Oh, yeah. I, I, um, I, well, I, I'm definitely going to listen to this podcast. Yeah, I think so. I, yeah. I think so. I will too. Because I, yeah. I like, I, th I think it is quite a sad story. And he was very, like, I think he felt quite on his own and a, lo a lot of pressure, the Italian pressure. Because I think this happens with French cyclists a lot as well. There's this, like, this pressure to like do well that must be like so intense yeah at like the the top level of sport so like the french teams and the french cyclists there's so much pressure on them to do well probably same for the italian cyclists like the new the all blacks the new zealand rugby team like the pressure for them to win must be like just like horrible to like have to deal with yeah it's sad i, I i've ridden his bike have you? Yep. Weird fact. Oh, was it a Villier? Yeah, because like, he was sponsored. Yeah. Uh, I think he had two two iterations of a Villier. But it was like the first ever carbon race bike that they did. Yeah. So he has he had an alloy one one year. It was in 1996, 1997, and then he had a carbon version, which is the version that I rode. Right. And it was it was quite good. Mm. Like it felt like a good bike. With the cassette, however, was the just horrible like, ratios. <laughs> yeah. Mental. Uh, just tiny. In, in fact, the uh, the Atticus factory manager, which we we've been working with her for six years or something now, mm. so our new factory is also with the same person. She used to work with Pantani back in the day because she used to she was like one of the liaison people with whatever team he worked with. Or oh, I think I T I T. What's the like? I think there was like a components company, an Italian components company, which was sponsored like all of the teams, like I T something or other. So I think she worked for them. So she, I've heard lots of stories about what he was like, direct. Nice guy. He really does look like you. I've Focus. got a picture of him. Focused. Focused. It's probably the, the best way to put him. Dedicated. Yeah. Nice. So our rim break's dead. <laughs> I went way off topic. <laughs> Not yet. But they're close. It is close, isn't it? Probably close. It is probably close. Fuck up off the week. you got to harmonize me. Wee. Oh, God. <laughs> I thought my one last week was bad. <laughs> someone like, would write us a theme tune. No, I know there's I'm musicians that watch these. There could be someone, Mary, Mary, can you make us a uh, introduction for the whole podcast and specifically one for fuck up of the week? That would be amazing. Thank you. In about two or three weeks' time, I am actually moving out of my temporary house to my real house. house and your music studio. And my studio comes out of storage. And we will legitimately write a theme tune. Let's this. do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. But it might even be. What if there's? You've heard some of my other music, so if we just put it in the same spectrum of that, it's going to be fantastic. That'll be brilliant. The one about pizza. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah, uh, fuck up of the week is. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Oh, I laughed for so long <laughs> because. <laughs> That's such an irrational what response happened? to this. Why is I... that funny? Because <laughs> Jimmy got a stone wire bee on his head. If I was a bee, I would sting your head. What is wrong with you? I just would. You, your brain. I would. <laughs> it needs rest. It needs rest. So on Wednesday, I think it was, I went for a bike ride after work. 
Uh, I have a, a, a cycling helmet. I was going to say the manufacturer of it. Gravel specific. It doesn't even matter. If it were perhaps that Gravel would Gravel specific would protect you from bees. So obviously nearly every single helmet apart from aero ones have vents. And I was riding along a gravel path, having a lovely time. At the start of, uh, I was going to do about two, two and a half hours. And a bumblebee flew into my helmet. I very quickly, normally if a bug, I didn't know it was a bumblebee at this point. Mm. Normally if a bug flies into the helmet, you give it a little wobble and it'll just fly back out again. Bearing in mind, I haven't got hair in the way. Um, and I gave it a little wobble. And what I realized very quickly is there was a very sharp pain two or three times as a result of it. So I pulled over, took my helmet off, a bumblebee fell on the floor, and my first thought was I need to get the stinger out. But Good, yeah. I've learned a fact for, about this. Bumblebees don't die when after they've stung you. That goes against everything I ever thought. Because of the word bee, isn't it? Well, uh, you know wasps don't wasp, you know wasps don't die after they sting you, don't you? Yeah. You can sting as many times as they want. Yeah. Yeah. I thought all bees. No, I guess a normal bee. I don't know. I don't. I wasn't sure about a normal bee. I thought a bumblebee specifically lost its stinger into your skin, and then it would then fly off, and it that it would then die. So after this bumblebee fell out of my helmet, um, I rather than to enrage, stamp on it uh, to kind of make myself feel better, I kind of gently moved it to the side. I don't know why. It's kind of a weird thing to do to a, a, bum, a bumblebee on the floor not moving. Um, and then it started wriggling. And then, like, I guess it was stunned. And then about 20 seconds later, it just flew off. And I was like, oh, that's kind of nice. So I did a bit of Googling because I thought that's a bit odd. And it turns out that bumblebees, much like wasps, can sting as much as they want. What I have learned is that it's specifically honeybees that lose their stinger. Interesting. Is it? It's not, well, they don't know, do they? The um, the, sorry, bumblebees, they don't sting you out of malice. No, it's they, usually they only like they're very, very chill, aren't they? Yeah. They're kind of they're nice. Yeah, well, or is it? It literally, you know, it? it was it was pinned in between my scalp and my helmet, and then I was banging my helmet, presumably on it, thinking it was just like a little fly and it would just fly out, but it decided like, all right, I'm going to give you a little dig first, and then I'm going to leave. Mm. Uh, but the reason this is fuck up of the week is. To we, lead us. We were then Absolutely. we then sh shot in the studio on the Thursday, and then we were going to go outside and film some stuff on the Friday. But I was very concerned. Well, what I wanted to be uh, careful of is to not end up with an infection, putting a helmet then on top of it. So we delayed it a couple of days and filmed it on the Sunday instead. So I lost a weekend day, which makes me very sad. Oh, you didn't seem that sad. We actually had a really nice day. Yeah, it was a good day. Yeah, yeah. the sun was out. <laughs> We had today it's raining. We're inside doing a podcast. Easy, you perfect. Gave, you gave me two cans of, of Coke Zero. Yeah, and and made me a, a sandwich for lunch. So yeah, I can't complain really. Yeah, a fake chicken nuggets. Mm -hmm. mm, that was good. Um, I had a full face helmet on once, mountain biking, and I was in Verbia with Sun God, and we got to the top of one of the like the lifts because you get lifts up to the top, and then someone was flying a drone, and I was looking for it. And then it wasn't a drone. It was inside my helmet. It was my it was bumblebee. A bee. Oh, this, that's a YouTube creator's brain, isn't it? Straight to drone. It must be a drone. Where's the drone? That was Stop a bee inside my it. helmet. And then I couldn't get it. It was like a rental helmet. And I couldn't I figure out where the like strap was to get it off. But I didn't get stuck, luckily. So, so what, what happened? Why it just kind of bounced around? Climax. Yeah, it was just in my head, just buzzing around. Horrible. The, but the, loud. Like, it sounded like a drone. There was a sci-fi film that I saw as a child, or I saw a clip of it on TV as a child, that I can still remember the scene to this day, and I do not know what the film is. So if anyone knows what film this is, please let me know. It was like some weird fake planet with an alien person that captured the human, and they, they got this, like, giant earwig, cut it open, and there was, like, hundreds of little ones, and they put it inside the space helmet and then put it on his head, and then what is it is, and... Hey, it's brain out. That's horrible. So that, that nearly happened to you. What kind of movies are you watching? It's time for another round of overrated, underrated. This is my favourite section now. I love this bit. Yeah, me too. It's just, it's just fun. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like a quiz. Mm -hmm. It's the quiz on me. The quiz is always you asking me. Is it? Or shall I ask you? Well, I, I think it's actually both of our opinions. Oh, but, you know, if you want to make it about you. So we've got a bunch of stuff and we're going to say them and then say if they are 
underrated or overrated, and the first one today is chain wax. Overrated. I agree. Absolute junk. All it does is make your bike messy. If you were, if you lived no one in is. the UK. No one is. <laughs> no one is. <laughs> if you lived in Spain, in a place that is very dry and not that dusty, with lovely smooth roads and only ever do TTs seven days a week, then I would, if I was that person, I'd work on a chain. If not, it's just not worth it, is it? Even the pro, like, definitely wax on the chain out of a pot, nah. Molten wax where you dip your chain and treat it. Who has time for that? Even if you are that per person in that perfect scenario, there's still no real need to do it. Like three watts. But they still don't need those three watts. If they're like a uh, legitimate professional athlete being paid to race bikes and the, th the results they get has an impact on their future. No, but some sure. Okay, yeah, but some people just like the incremental, oh, I change this and then I do, yeah, they do the same TT every week and they're looking for lots of little things they can do to see if it makes a difference. And then it's a PB. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but they don't need it. I don't it's, need it's it, yeah. Overrated. It is, okay, uh, it's disgusting. It is overrated. It's horrible. It makes your bike dirty. It clogs everything up. It's just, it's. No, no, no. I would argue no. uh, molten wax thing, it stays quite clean. No. But it's still annoying. It's horrible. And more effort than it's worth. Yeah. Next, steel bikes. I love steel bikes. Me too. I own two. I Both don't. of them are custom. I love them to bits. Yeah. I will always own them for my entire life. Yeah. Um, they're very well rated. Yep. And they should be. Yep. Potentially uh, underrated by some people yes, who yes. think that carbon is the only way. Mm -hmm. uh, but in actual fact, they don't need a carbon bike for the road and they're doing and probably be happier and better on a steel bike, maybe. Yeah. Uh, if I was to own a steel bike, mm -hmm. I would do custom made. And because it will last a very, very long time and you mm -hmm. will make sure it's right from the off. I would also do stainless because it's marginally more expensive, but it's, it's far a, better it's a long in terms of longevity. It's not, no, per tube, it's not that much more. To get it manufactured is more expensive. So to weld stainless is a different process to welding just normal steel. Because Pickle's bike, I have a friend called Dylan, Dill Pickle. Yeah. He, and we did a video on his custom quirk and it didn't, it was a few hundred pounds more for Rob to do him a stainless steel bike. And that was a really good usage of the stainless steel because even if you, uh, living here, it would still last a long time. It stops it from rusting on the inside, even if it's painted. Uh, yeah. it, it, it lasts longer before it starts to rust. Great. He works, he lives and works on a boat. Mm -hmm. And when he is back in the UK uh, to see his family, they're on the coast. So salt is a big problem. And therefore, if he had a regular steel bike, it would accelerate that process even more. And it, you know. Two things on that. I would probably hazard a guess then that Rob's normal steel bikes are quite expensive in the first place for the stainless to only be a couple of hundred quid more. Typically, it's like a thousand pounds more for stainless versus non-stainless. Right, okay. So like a, like both of my custom bikes, one of which was about is about 10 years old now, the other one is a couple of months old. Mm -hmm. um, for a full steel frame set, painted, finished, ready to be built, is like under 2,000 pounds. Yep. Um, the you are right that stainless definitely <clears throat> excuse me you are right that stainless definitely lasts longer than non-stainless steel however if the paint is good and you treat the inside and you look after your, your bike it's still going to last a long time mm -hmm. like my original steel bike if you look inside it it looks rust to fuck but it's solid. It's still perfect. Mm -hmm. And arguably, if one of the tubes is knackered, you can get it cut out and put a new one in. Cool. Shave legs. Overrated. Underrated. What? If you have hairy legs, your bib shorts and socks move around everywhere and you end up with super short shorts if you wear lycra shorts. Well, you, that doesn't make them underrated. Why? Well... Because there's benefits you didn't even realise and didn't consider. Well, no, I do know that. Yeah, exactly. Like, otherwise, you're going to be right now. Yeah. 
and your shorts end up like little hot pants. Well, they, well, they don't. You've seen them. They, they will rise a little bit more than if I didn't. If if I did no, have shit. Annoying. Plus, and then if you are wearing leg warmers, they don't stay on properly. They do because they don't stick. They, they don't. They do. They don't. They do. They you're, don't. Not, you're not putting them on properly. I can show you. No, I'm putting them on right. You know, I know how to put on leg warmers. Um, shaved legs is absolutely pointless. It's unnecessary. It's elitist, and it 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 tells people that to look like a road cyclist, you have to shave your legs. And that is definitely something that, th it's the only reason I ever shaved my legs. It does. The only reason I ever shaved my legs is because that's what you have to do to fit in, in, in like the road cycling mm -hmm. space. I would hope that now it's not quite like that because there's a lot more of accessible communities in road cycling. Whereas like when I started riding bikes, it was like the club space. This is what you if, do. If you, you turned you up at a crib. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 has, that really has changed. Yeah, really I think has it has. Changed. I think it but has. I've p been out of that for a long time yeah. and enjoyed my time out of it. And I was always riding with one or two people. Like I remember Pete being in, we were elite bike racers at the time. I was with Pete Hawkins. He's raced for Sigma Sports and he lives in Newcastle now. Mm -hmm. Top guy, been in my videos lots. And we were in Calp for, or Calp or Calpe for our uh, yearly training camp where we go and do two or three weeks in the sun in winter. And he'd always have hairy legs. It's I, just a fuck you to I love all those people. Him. Yeah, and Greg does what he wants. He is, he is like no rules mantra to a team. He won't mind me saying this. Yeah, yeah, the other day we were at the pub. No shoes. He just doesn't care. Admittedly, he'd been to yoga just before. But no shoes. Bearing no in mind shoes. as well, Doesn't give a fuck. Pete is probably the most elite cyclist we actually know because he's legitimately represented Ireland in the Commonwealth Games. In terms right? of, uh, yeah, Commonwealth Games, uh, breakaway in the Tour of Britain. In terms of like people who I consider close friends, yeah. he's got the furthest in the sport, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And is a brilliant example of not being an elitist. I yeah, yeah, yeah. he does exactly what he wants, which is great. So I would say, you know, my opinion is if shave me if you want to, don't shave me if you don't want to. But there are benefits. And the main benefit for that thing, the reason I continue to shave my legs is the leg warmers slipping down and shorts riding up. That's just annoying me. The, the only one that I will accept is my legs tan better when they're shaved. You do need vitamin D. You do. Especially you do. when you live in the northeast. You do. But all Take of the, all you can get. All of the traditional reasons for shaving your legs are a load of bullshit to normal people. Overrated. Mm -hmm. Next one is titanium bikes. <laughs> um, it's, it's a very easy one for me. They are, without a doubt, the most overrated type of bike. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. They're just... <laughs> outrageously overrated there's nothing special about them i would pick a steel bike over a titanium bike every single day of the week as far as i understand a titanium bike has to be made in such an incredibly skilled way to be any different from an alloy bike and an alloy bike is a third of the price very cheap well perhaps not anymore but definitely historically yeah. They have, admittedly, titanium bikes have got better because the practice, so in order to make a titanium frame and successfully weld the tubes together, you need a very clean environment. Most places that have historically built bikes, like Rob Quirk's workshop, is a, not it's a clean environment, it's a workshop. Yeah. So people like Rob trying to make a titanium bike, um, I don't know if the results have been very good. Whereas uh, now, particularly in the Far East, they really nailed the building of titanium bikes because there's lots being made, like the Jay Guillaume's that Nick sells at his shop, mm -hmm. and they, um, they're they not falling apart. Whereas in the past, there were lots of titanium bikes that would just break all, all the welds. That was the known thing. And I was yeah. like, oh, look, a titanium bike's come in the shop and it's got another broken thing. Yeah, I remember it, that happening a yeah. lot. Whereas now I haven't seen it. So clearly, humans have got better at making them. However, is there a reason other than, oh, look, it buffs out and look at my nice titanium bike. No. I, I, I don't understand why so many people put titanium on a pedestal for bike frames. Mm. I, I, I honestly just don't understand it because the amount of comments we get where it's just like, oh, yeah, what about titanium? What about titanium? Yeah. Like, of course, it's, you know, something to consider, but like... It's cool. It's different. 
Well, it isn't different anymore. Well, no, Everyone's got a titanium yeah. bike, especially in the Northeast, because Nick sells everyone a JD. <laughs> Everyone's got a JD, yeah. And they're all identical. Yeah. Even if it's a different model, it looks the same. Yeah. <laughs> I and a new one where the fork goes in the headset around the headset it looks really good it does if you if you notice it but if you had like four jay gians they'd lined all up, kind of look the same they'd all look the same or actually not even just yeah. jay gians if you brought some other titanium bikes in they would just look the same yeah yeah perhaps that's one of the reasons that i'm I, i'm not into them is I, I do like unique stuff i like stuff to have like a bit of that's something original about it or something unique about it and mm -hmm. it just seems like titanium has become the the new like thing for everything for sure 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 it, they're, they're not bad yeah but they are overrated yeah yep. D do you know anything about so a lot of people used to talk about titanium is more comfortable than all other materials it, it's it's uh, as far as i'm aware that is incorrect right it's a like that's uh, what i would expect uh, uh, yeah yeah so yeah overrated because the properties of it are very similar to alloy so the the, the something to do with the the you know, you know what? Speculation. I'll go into it. Speculation. Speculation. <laughs> I've definitely looked at some stuff, which which the conclusion was. Some engineers looking at it. The conclusion was it should ride the same as an aluminium frame. I can give and you a fact. People you think it doesn't because they've spent loads of money on it. Do you want to know a fact? Yeah. Titanium overrated. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Who made this list? Lance Armstrong. Overrated or underrated? Well, I just what's, found what's out. Your case uh, first. Yeah, what's your case? <laughs> Our podcast gets more views than his. Does it? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. So, I rated, clearly. <laughs> At least in the podcast space. Uh, um, do, do people rate him still? Well, I don't know. If I don't you, right, know. So, so let, me, let me give you this as, as a, a case. Yeah. He's a very, very famous professional cyclist, probably one of the most famous cyclists of all time. Mm. And he has won practically no races. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at his yeah, yeah. official oh, record. the official record, right. There is zero wins. He's never won the Tour de France. He's never won the... Well, I don't actually know. He might have won the Giro, but he, he might have a couple of wins. He's, he's done well for himself, considering he's got no Palmares. He's, he's a fantastic marketer. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a fact about Lance Armstrong. Yeah? Mm. The reason he's really rich again, because he invested in Uber at the right time. Early on. Early on. Early Uber investor. Yeah. Uh... Nah, I mean, did loads of really shitty stuff. Not a big fan, but it is still, whenever there's a new documentary about Lance Armstrong, like iPlayer came up with one a couple of years ago. I'm yeah. oh, straight on. Like, it's fascinating. And also, his podcast is also fascinating. In, not when it's just about pro racing, but when they got onto other stuff, it is like, oh, there's something, uh, they are just interesting to listen to, which is annoying, considering... They're on paper not very nice people. I think um, I quite. I, to be honest, jokes aside, I quite like him. Uh, he's done loads of stuff. He he's promoted cycling a lot. He was an amazing triathlete actually before he even got into road cycling. So when triathlon was like in its infancy, he was involved in it and like really competitive. The problem I have with him and all of the badness that he brought into cycling is. It feels like it's only now that cycling is starting to be looked at as not just this like weird dope space. Like all of the stuff that came out in, all of that in the damage 90s has lasted so exactly. long. Exactly. It's taken 20 so years to shed that for someone like Netflix to come along and make a documentary about the sport because they wouldn't even consider it 10 years ago, 20 years ago, because it was just dirt. You know, the only thing yeah, they could yeah, have yeah. ever done is, or, or what people did do is they made stuff about drugs and all of the bad stuff that was happening which was terrible for cycling as it oh, yeah. oh netflix did do a documentary yeah that brian um brian fogel ben fogel ben. no who's someone fogel brian fogel icarus the documentary where the guy starts yeah. off tries to dope himself and see how far he can get in the sport and then he ends up rumbling a massive yeah. like Such uh, a very very sponsored russian do it brilliant <laughs> but that was the only documentary that uh like netflix kind of pushed wasn't it yeah and became big Yep. My, uh, I'm going to say Lance Armstrong is overrated due to the fact he fucked the cycling industry for 20 to 25 years. And this is the last time we will ever speak of him, hopefully. And the last one on the list is... Campagnolo. Good pronunciation, like that. Actually, no, I pronounced the G. Campagnolo. Camp Campagnolo. Camp okay. <laughs> when I first met Nick... Yeah. He was... 
Fanboy. Obsessed. Fanboy, yeah, yeah. To the point that he once gave me a like a, a book that was just like dedicated to Campag. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you need to read this and then you'll understand. Bearing in mind, I, I you know, I, yeah, actually, yeah, when I met him, I did have a Campag group set. Mm-hmm. Um, Campag are at the forefront of lots of things that have had an impact in the cycling. And caught on from mech. They I think, invented the front mech. I think there's loads of stuff yeah, yeah. They, they were the first of. Um, they've obviously not been there in recent years, but in terms of their their position in where we are now as cyclists, they like paved the way in, for, in so many ways. Um, there are definitely people that are like fanatical about Campag, especially when the rest of the bike is Italian as well. There are a lot of people which say, like, if it's an Italian bike, it has to have Campag. I say, fuck the rules, do what you want. Mm. Um, I do like Campag. I like how consistent they are. And they haven't, like, over the years that I've been cycling, they've only had a couple of wobbles in terms of things that could be bad about the products. Could be considered bad about the products. Yeah. You know, they've, they've made most of the time good group sets at decent prices and they've always offered a entry level option i was trying to see if i could find a list of some of their like firsts but there's so many products that they've like it's just the list is just massive yeah there it was the introduction of electric stuff recently where they haven't quite been on top of the game they haven't been able to compete with shaman shimano and even the latest uh well not the latest the, the the eps that came out which was wired that the ends were too big and it was just a pain in the ass getting it through frames and it was just it didn't quite work as well as it should the new wireless haven't tried it haven't seen it in person i'm um, excited to see if they've rectified some of the issues so i'm going to say campag pre like 2008 underrated because mm-hmm. it is it is exceptional mm-hmm. Modern Campag, excluding the most recent stuff, unbelievably overrated. The new stuff, TBC. I don't know. TBC, but it's so expensive, it's just a luxury yeah. thing. Yeah, but it might, it might trickle down. It might trickle down to like lower know. group sets. Well, that does happen. It does, well, yeah. I mean, SRAM, it did actually happen. Exactly. Shimano, exactly. it definitely is happening. They're a long way behind, right. though, aren't they? Like, SRAM have, SRAM, have, SRAM have trickled down so far now because they've been in the They're game. They're just ahead. ahead, yeah. I, I I would love Campag to be back on the top again. Oh, that would be awesome. And more competition is good. More I competition do. is good. I do like it. So are you saying overrated or underrated? Indifferent. I can't decide. You have to. It's the rules. Underrated. Next up, listeners take over. And we have a question on YouTube from Donald. I currently have a cheap bike with Turney with their SDI shifters. I priced out 105 R7000 for about $360. I was going to make that my next upgrade. Would you still recommend waiting until last to upgrade the group set? Which is in reference to something we put at the end of a video the other day where we said you should upgrade your group set last because it doesn't make that much difference. Mm -hmm. If you're in this situation where the group set you have is turny and you have those horrible turny levers... If if they're the ones where like the the downshift is the sun the sunny bit yeah then they're horrible they are horrible the ergonomics are horrible you can't access the gears properly if you are on the drop handlebars I would upgrade that as soon as possible whether you need to jump to one hundred five at three hundred sixty dollars is a lot of money I think the I think the sentiment still stands though it probably is the last thing that should be upgraded but it is something I would want to upgrade yeah. I would want to get rid of that quickly. I definitely would want to update that group set, but I would be looking at the other things first. For example, tires, saddle, bar shape, if it's got a horrible bar shape on it, mm-hmm. uh, potentially wheels, depending on what the wheels are, um, and then eventually get to do a group set one day. And your bar shape is going to feel terrible, no matter what shape it is with these shit. They are really they are really bad. But they're getting phased out. Good. So that's good. good. Question from Mel. Being a YouTuber slash video maker always seems so glamorous, but what's the best and worst things about your job? It can't be all as fun as it looks, right? I mean, we don't film the 
hours and hours and hours and hours of editing and sitting indoors having meetings planning uh there's a lot of like logistics some intense discussion between me and you where we disagree about lots of things yeah i, th I think probably the bits that most people underestimate and i've i've been on some traveling trips with you and obviously you go on a lot without me mm -hmm. i don't like going on those trips and i'm not even editing a video just from me being there and editing photos it's work man like mm. e even whilst the ride is happening you're thinking about or e whoever's there the participants are thinking about have we got a good video out of this is it entertaining? What do we need to talk about so it's good? Like, even when you're going away on long trips, like, it's up in the morning, get out, ride, make sure you're filming enough stuff, get back, eat, edit, sleep, book a hotel for the next day, plan a route for the next day, go. Like, it's intense. Mm. We did uh, we did four days in a row in Spain, and I was like, yeah, this isn't for me. I'm not in. <laughs> excluding, excluding the fact I was unbelievably ill, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you even if you discount that, I'm like, it's not a lifestyle I, I'm I'm a fan of. None of that. You have to be ready for it. it. Is on the flip side, you there, you end up seeing some amazing stuff through a land. And at at my only, um, my only way of doing all of those things at that point in my life was to do this. Yeah. Because I didn't have loads of money to spend on flying places and doing these things, so that that makes it accessible. Uh, the flip the you know the trade off is shit tons of work. I uh, see uh, from my experience of having taken lots of photos because I've done a lot more photos over the years uh, wh where you've been making YouTube videos I've been shooting photos for Atticus and the amount of times that you end up getting back to like editing I was gonna say the edit suite first it's just a laptop. yeah it's a laptop with Lightroom on it and you I, I'm Go looking through these photos I'm like oh this is amazing because in the moment, I'm not even processing my surroundings or the things that I'm looking at. I'm mm. literally like seeing life like through a camera. Oh, here's a weird thing. I honestly can't remember most of two bikes, one wheelchair cycling across America. I can believe that. It would, if I went back and watched stuff, it would trigger the memories. Mm -hmm. But if I tried to think now what happened when, no, not a chance. There's so many things I've just forgotten, mm. plain forgotten which is bonkers because like with the cognitive load, particularly for that trip, because it wasn't just like riding a bike every day either. It was a lot of thinking mm -hmm. and trying to stay safe and challenging routes and problem solving. It was just problem after problem after problem. You're constantly doing it. And that's what a bike packing trip is, yeah. but that was a whole new level. And then on top of that, it was 60, 60 videos in 60 days. A, the cognitive load is just too much to there's a lot to something has to give and obviously memories <laughs> see ya <laughs> but it raised 200 grand for charity worth it yeah so yeah 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 um it's fun though I, and I also found uh, without going too off topic here we have changed drastically the type of videos we're making and the way we work now uh well now it's a we it's not just a me mm-hmm um, I have never been happier. Oh, so with work, is it good like, to look so at my much. face every day? Uh, no, it's not that. And then but. you go home and then edit, looking at my face again. <laughs> that is that is exactly why, Jimmy. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, uh, don't underestimate it. It's just a much more balanced, uh, balanced way to live. But uh, we wouldn't be here had I, had I not done all of that work. But we could talk about this more in depth in a, another future podcast, um, specifically about. K media and YouTube stuff. Right. One more question. I've lost where we are on the PDF. Here, I've highlighted it. Oh, yeah. Discuss. What? Oh, oh no. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> there, go. One of the most frequent questions and requests we get lately is asking whether we'll make a video on tips for buying a secondhand bike. Pointless video. It's too much of a minefield. Well, it's not a pointless video. It's... Uh, what tips are you going to give people? It's, it's hard to do it correctly, I think. Uh, the challenges that we have, uh, full disclosure, is there's a sponsorship with Scott, which makes it hard for us just to go to market and start buying any bike, uh, which, which is a challenge for making that video. I mean, they're, they're pretty cool with it. 
Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But like, you know, that's one challenge. Uh, the other thing which we both struggle with is it's hard to tell someone which doesn't know what they're looking for to go and buy something which requires you to know what you're looking for. Yeah. You don't know what condition it's in. If you don't understand the mechanics of the bike and the maintenance of the bike, it's hard to say, look for these things if that doesn't mean anything. What's more, if you're buying something secondhand off someone you've never met, it could which will be most situations. What, it, it could be written yeah, off. You, you, you physically cannot check all of these things in the short amount of time you're meeting someone to exchange a product. Mm. Like, it's just unrealistic. Unless you are extremely experienced with buying bikes and being around bikes and you work in a bike shop and you just know what you're looking for and it's a thing that you wanted and you've found and there's only one of them. And as you're in that situation, you the options are go to cycle exchange or a similar shop. That is the only option. Well, there are other ones, aren't there? Perhaps not for high-end bikes, but for, like, bikes. That's what I mean, or similar shops. Yeah, I think that's... there's lots of shops that yeah, sell yeah, second-hand. Yeah. You go to a place where a bike shop has given it once over and that's it. And probably has a warranty on it. Yeah, uh, cycle exchange x-ray stuff. But if you if you compare it to, say, like, buying a car, it's kind of the same thing. Like, you either take a mechanic with you who does the once-over and goes, like, yeah, I'm pretty happy with it, or you take a risk that you buy a bike... You go to a bike shop and the and the bike shop says, actually, you need to spend 300 quid on replacing this and replacing that. Or you just ride it and just wreck it. Mm. Ultimately, it's quite hard for us to be able to recommend tips in that space because we don't want to recommend something which actually gets someone a crap product. Yeah. Minefield. Total minefield. That is the end of the podcast uh, if you have any questions or stories please send it to wild ones podcast at cademedia.co.uk and that is all for this episode we would like you to subscribe if you're watching on youtube as well so please do that and if you're listening on a podcast follow follow can you do that review give us reviews reviews oh, are good reviews are good obviously five star ones mm -hmm. um that helps thank you and this week, we're going to leave you with a rendition of one of my favorite personal tracks that I recorded. Um, there's guest vocals on it from Emily Childs and Nick Harnett. And this track is entitled Pizza. Boom. Goodbye. Pizza. I wish the world was made of pizza. Living in a margarita. Cause it's my favorite kind of pizza. Oh yeah! It's dough time. I love pizza, one kind of pizza. There's only one pizza I love. No anchovies, dips, the pepperonis. There's only one pizza I love. Pizza! I wish the world was made of pizza. Living in a margarita. Cause it's my favorite kind of pizza Oh yeah It's dough time